Next on Meet the Farmer TV, we talk with two plaintiffs in a lawsuit against Monsanto. The companies that have these patents on our food have had, uh, you know, over 20 years to make billions of dollars that they can throw at anything we do to try to change the situation. And the only way it's going to be is going to be something like in the civil rights movement. If you go to the grocery store, I don't care, the best organic grocery stores that we've got, you don't get food that has anything like the flavor that comes from the best sellers at the farmer's market. This program is a production of Meet the Farmer TV, LLC, in association with Planet Earth Diversified, Nelly Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design. So here we are, we're going to talk to a couple plaintiffs in the Monsanto lawsuit. So Ira, I know you from the Seed Exchange, but how did you get started in this, this court case? Well, gosh, uh, well, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, we uh, were approached about joining in this lawsuit against Monsanto. And we've been, you know, raising the issue of transgenics and how it affects us because we're a seed company where we're at risk of having contamination. And this lawsuit came along and it seemed like the right thing to do to uh, become a part of trying to stand up against Monsanto. Uh, you know, and it also gives us an opportunity to educate as many people as we can in the public about uh, the dangers to our health, uh, to the purity of our food uh, system, to our seeds, uh, by joining in with all of these other seed companies and consumers and farmers and saying no to GMO. So your customers actually want you to tell them that the seeds they get from you are guaranteed not to be transgenic. They absolutely care and we do things like testing, having guidelines about how far you have to be from other farms that are producing the type of seed to try as much as we can to offer a guarantee to our customers that they're going to get pure uh, seed from us. And this is Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. That's us, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Is there a website? SouthernExposure.com. Come there. We have lots of information about the lawsuit, about growing food, uh, and uh, all the things that are going on to support that kind of activity in our region. Terrific. All right, Don, so tell me how you've been farming for for years multi-generational since 1730 or something I <laughs> I'm Don Patterson and uh, um, my involvement in farming uh, ended back at the end of the 80s when I saw what was coming down the pike with Monsanto's project and because I knew starting in 1980 that they were developing their seed and it smelled wrong to me from the start. Um, uh, I'll tell you a story. There was a group of um, American agriculture movement farmers that went up to the White House back in 1980 and they met there with Stuart Eisenstadt who was uh, President Carter's uh, domestic policy advisor. Mm -hmm. And Eisenstadt said, we're going to see to it that you can never do this again, that you can never come to Washington on tractors again like you did. And we didn't know then what they were talking about. But now we can see that already then, see they had the decision that allowed life to be patented. The Chakrabarti decision, uh, Chakrabarti versus Diamond happened back then and immediately they, Monsanto was on that to start to develop transgenic seeds. It took them a decade to develop, and then in 1992, um, despite what was said by scientists at the FDA about the dangers of this, about, aller about allergies, about toxicity, about new diseases, about nutritional issues, all those things were on the minds of the FDA scientists, but they were overruled by the politicians, by uh, the announcement that was made by Dan Quayle in 1992 saying that these things were generally recognized as safe. And they knew that that wasn't true. Michael Taylor, who had been an attorney for Monsanto, was brought into the FDA 
to herd this process through. And he's come back now in the Obama administration again uh, to be the food safety czar. Monsanto's chief lobbyist. Mm. That's what he was in the interim between those two. He was their, their attorney working for a private firm but working for them. He'd been with the FDA earlier in his career. He graduated from the UVA law school many years ago and, uh, and then came back now to be the food safety czar. We knew immediately where Obama stood on these issues when they brought a man like that back into the program. The main thing that I've been involved in is the, is the, is the politics of all this over the years. But um, I farmed um, with my ex-wife on a farm that was owned in her family until we were divorced. And after we were divorced, I had to decide what I was going to do. And I still stayed involved. It was after that, that I was uh, um, an officer of the American Agricultural Movement and was involved in all that. But I had to decide whether I was going to farm or not farm anymore at, at that point. And uh, I decided that, that, that this situation with Monsanto and with others coming down with transgenic agriculture was, I mean, I could get contaminated and I could pass that contamination on to somebody else accidentally and then their generations of families in the future, I worry about the personal guilt associated with that, with that uh, uh, possibility. So it's really, this is a really a complex thing because there, there are people like you that are, that are very concerned with their personal ethics. They don't want to promulgate transgenic material through multiple gen generations. They don't even want to farm because they're the, the risk of making more of it. And then there are people like farmers that have gotten sick from using the, the, the terrible chemicals that they needed to use to keep the corn from getting corn rootworm and are somewhat happy that now with the, the GMO material they don't have to use those chemicals anymore and they're making more money on the, the corn. And then there are people uh, like the Gates Foundation who think that this is the, the solution to world poverty and, and Monsanto's a hero that they're going to they're gonna engineer food that can grow in drought and, 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 and maybe even reverse climate change. And, and then there are people that just, the, the politicians that are like lobbied just with cash and they kind of see some of our concerns like we're just kind of, you know, leftover crackpot hippies and, and we're still stuck on organic and just against corporations. So, Don, what, what, what's well, your angle on the lawsuit? <laughs> well, um, I have been opposed to the patenting of seeds. And uh, um, my background is I grew up on a dairy farm in western New York and, uh, um, and was uh, also here in Virginia, moved to Virginia when I was um, a teenager. My family moved down here and we still continued to farm some but not as extensively as we did in New York. And, and actually my ancestors settled farming ancestors settled in Virginia in 1730. Mm. And so I'm, I'm in this lawsuit in part because I want to honor the memory of these Quaker farmers who farmed with a kind of integrity that I wish we still had in, yeah. this, in this country. But uh, I was a Virginia state coordinator of the American agriculture movement back in the 70s uh, when we drove, took tractors to Washington mm -hmm. and uh, sometime national delegate and I was uh, um, also executive uh, vice president of the American Agriculture Movement when we filed lawsuit against the Chicago Board of Trade for manip manipulating the soybean price. So I've been at this business for a long time and one of the reasons that I wanted to do this lawsuit and, and spent a year pulling together the plaintiffs to do it was uh, um, that I knew that to get this done through lobbying it would take us a year and millions of dollars and millions mm -hmm. of people to ever do this before the Congress now with the power that they have uh, over um, what Congress does through lobbying and through campaign contributions. And we could see this just this year, you know, when they voted on the labeling in the Congress, you know, they, they got 26 votes in favor of labeling in the Senate and 71 or something uh, opposed to it. Um, and even when, I think you were telling me, you, you uh, uh, 
talked to Senator Kane about it, and he's saying, well, we think this ought to be done by the federal government and not by the state government, all the different states, and so we didn't want to allow the states to do it. But the federal government hasn't done anything. Here's what I'll um, do. Uh, Obama president. promised to do it back in 2007 in Iowa. He said that he was in favor of labeling, but he's been a president now here into the second term and hasn't done a thing about it. And he's even praised his Secretary of Agriculture for the commitment and the efforts that he's made on behalf of biotech agriculture. So, <laughs> so it's kind of going the other way. Yeah, right. I mean, these people are in the tank um, with, uh, with Monsanto. And, and see, we're in a culture where people think that science is always better than what nature can do. And, uh, and so they don't want us to do anything that would stop the great wisdom of man um, knowing better about how to organize um, nature than nature knows. We've uh, done so well so far. <laughs> <laughs> the planet's just healthy and we, we don't have any climate issues. No, <laughs> right, we're yeah. all well fed and everything's just fine. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and we're losing yeah, varieties. We're coming along. But yeah. uh, see, and they're not looking at all the things that are happening in Europe and other countries because we don't do this research in this country. See, the patent owners can stop the research from happening. Mm -hmm. So we don't get to find out. Um, things that they know now in Europe, there's been more than a dozen studies, you know, that have been looking into what's wrong. Started back in 1998 with Arpad Bustai in England, you know, and he was in favor of the idea. He thought the idea of transgenic agriculture would be a good thing. Um, but as soon as they started to look at it, and they, it was a multi-center study from several different places, a taxpayer-funded study, because they thought they really ought to know, since people were going to be fed this stuff, they ought to know whether it was mm -hmm. good for them. And, the, and right away they found out, it was a three year long study, started in 1995, and by 1998 they, they were clear that uh, it wasn't good for people. And, it, 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 and uh, it, kidney problems, liver problems, immune system was knocked out. Uh, all sorts of issues. So, so the concern is our bodies have, have developed for millions of years expecting certain Things. genetic makeups. That's exactly right. And we right. start mixing that up, that it makes us as sick as it makes the bugs that we're trying to kill with these. Right. Th that was a BT, a BT potato. Mm -hmm. And it did the same kind of things that it, that the BT that BT does when you give it to bugs, except that it's worse. The natural BT is accepted in organ used judiciously in, in organic agriculture uh, because it's relatively be benign in its natural form. It doesn't mess up other things except the bugs. It does. Um, maybe get to some benign insects as well mm -hmm. as the, the uh, um, as well as the pests, but nonetheless, they found with the BT potato that it was penetrating the gut wall the same as it does with bugs mm. um, in people, and going straight to the pancreas, messing up the production of insulin, messing up the production of enzymes. The pancreas does two things: it it uh, um, facilitates the, the uh, enzymes that you need for digestion, and it also produces insulin. Well, now, some of these things aren't working well anymore for the corn farmers. The corn rootworm is, yeah. they're, they're bringing back the poisons because the BT corn's not working anymore. That's the, right, exactly. The insects, the, you know, the rapid life cycle of the insect leads to adaptation faster exactly. than our 100 year life cycle. Exactly. But see, they don't care. They haven't paid any attention to what the impacts of these are. They've created odd new proteins that the, the digestive system of people and animals has never seen before. And they just blow it off and keep on selling this stuff because they can get away with selling it. And uh, that's the Roundup Ready issue too. Mm -hmm. And with the Roundup Ready crops, you're messing with the, with the DNA of the gut bacteria. And that's where the immune system is centered in human health. So this is kind of thing, as I get it, it it's really seems backwards from what you'd expect because you, could, you can use this genetically modified material, you can put all kinds of approved poisons on it, and you don't pay anything to not label it. But if I want to grow it organically and not use GMO, mm -hmm. 
and not use the poisons. I got to pay thousands of dollars and submit myself to lots of Process. inspections. And the possibility that my neighbor's GMO corn blows on mine and contaminates mine, and then I can no longer claim my label and I even pay a fine because I claimed it was non-GMO and then it was. Not for my, for my well, intention. Well, Ira can tell you about that because she can tell you what she goes through with the uh, Southern Exposure yeah. Seed Exchange on the things that they have to do to make sure that they're not contaminated. Well, you know, our growers, we have protocols for not being contaminated. Mm -hmm. And then, in order to follow up on that, we have to do testing to make sure we didn't get accidental contamination. And uh, we had a case, it actually wasn't a crop that we were getting for ourselves, but we were helping another seed company with uh, one of our growers to grow something for them. And uh, they're a mile from anybody who is growing GM corn. Mm -hmm. And they had one lot that tested uh, positive for GMOs. And this just makes you think, oh my goodness, we have to even take more precautions, mm -hmm. you know, against this. And uh, if those neighbors' cows had come in and eaten your crop, you could, you know, get uh, some kind of judgment in court and they would have to pay or repair their fences or do something. But, uh, but because the pollen of the, blows over, because you've especially, got no yeah, because of this. Not only that, they've got, exactly. if you possess their gene without having paid a royalty for it, they can come after you. Yeah. That's what happened with uh, Percy Smizer up in Canada. Yeah. He was contaminated by a neighbor's, neighboring farm farmer who was driving a truck with seed mm -hmm. uh, past Percy's farm and the canvas tore in the wind, the canvas tore on the truck and the seed blew onto Percy's farm. Canola seed is a fairly light seed. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it, very fine. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, and uh, pollen can also travel, of course. Uh, uh, canola that's been a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know people that get have gotten transgenic canola hundreds of miles away from wherever anybody was growing it. Well, we're counting on the bees to do that. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, and to we're move this the pollen, birds, well, keep that. Speaking diversity. of the this birds, thing, these people were on a flyway, uh, and so they were getting the bird droppings coming onto their. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, another thing that's going on is uh, not so much directly about this lawsuit. But uh, I also am on the board of the Organic Seed Alliance, and we, that organization has been involved in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, where most of the uh, organic uh, beet and chard seed is produced, uh, with fighting Monsanto wanting to uh, grow that uh, crop there, their GMO sugar beets, when they know that that pollen travels for five miles, you know, just these big clouds of pollen at the, at the time and... What crop? Beets. Sugar we're talking beets? About, uh -huh. They're talking about GMO sugar beets, uh -huh. cross with chard. And this is like one of the only places that a large amount of organic seed is produced in the, in, in the country. And they've been growing this GMO stuff somewhere else before, but they decided they need to grow it there. And it's like a big fight. People, you know, like in the counties are trying to knock them out. They're taking people to court, you know, and they have a lot of money. And this is how they beat farmers down, you know. They take you to court about some, any, any nonsense, mm -hmm. and they just use up all your money until you just fall over and roll over. Well, that was the concern I expressed to Senator Kane. It's like, if we don't have some protection, you're telling me, well, don't worry about whether it's labeled genetically modified or not, you can label yours as organic or label it however you want and then you, you know you have a special label and if people are looking for it they can get that. But my concern is how do I protect myself from a Monsanto or someone that has a gene patent saying that my crop contains that. They've got the money to run the DNA test, I don't, and they could easily just run their test and know that the pollen is there. Uh -huh. and. I would get $1,100 per instance state fine for every time I claimed it wasn't and it got contaminated. But you know what they want to do now, Mike? They want to, um, uh, this Vilsack has set up a commission called the AC21 Commission, uh -huh. which is promoting coexistence. And, and we believe that coexistence is impossible. 
Right. And it's just a question of how long, and you know, you, you're going to get raped, you know, so it's just a question of when. What happened with this wheat thing that got out? Well, it was no, supposed to be all incinerated by the Colorado yeah. Seed Bank, but somehow yeah. it showed up well, but, in Oregon. Yeah, right, and, and that's a problem too. There's and they didn't even want it to they, grow. Yeah. yeah, right. So if they had something, they said this wasn't a good idea. I mean, if, if the guys that you are suing thought it wasn't a good idea and we should incinerate it and not pursue this gene patent, but it still got grown? Still yeah. got out. Well, right. And on a farm where he'd been growing wheat for now eight years or so. Saving his own seed? I, I don't know what the details were, but uh, somehow or other uh, this, this crop uh, got on to uh, this transgenic wheat got out after many years since the uh, um, mm -hmm. trial, field trials of the wheat in not close, but somewhere near in Western Oregon. And he wasn't trying Eastern to grow. Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. He was just no. trying to figure out that's why right. he couldn't kill it. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. But let me get back to this AC21 commission a minute. They, they, he rigged a commission of people that, that uh, would be favorable to the idea of creating a, an insurance program where anybody who gets contaminated can collect an insurance payment. And this is based on the idea that only thing that, that a organic or non-transgenic farmer might care about is whether or not they get money, mm -hmm. or whether or not they lose money. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, they don't allow for the fact that people have integrity about what they do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what they've done is they've recommended that there be set up, and the farmer would pay into it, with pay a premium in order to buy this insurance but there isn't enough money in the premiums to be able to pay out on the expected damage, mm -hmm. so the taxpayer has to subsidize it. Mm -hmm. So this is not just a wealth transfer program from the farmers to the insurance companies, but it's also uh, a wealth transfer program from the taxpayer um, right. uh, to, to, to subsidize the payment. And they hope mm -hmm. to buy off the, pe the people's concern about the possibility of contamination by paying out these insurance revenues. Well, uh, in addition uh, to that, they're, they want to, instead of have, having zero tolerance along with that, have some percentage of GMO contamination that okay. is acceptable. Right. Like yeah. the filth, man, yeah. there's a certain percentage of filth that can be yeah. in food yeah. and it's okay. Yeah. And yeah. So GMO just becomes and, a filth component. Yeah, and if you have a small amount of contamination and you keep growing that seed, you can, uh, inadvertently increase the amount of contamination uh, well, now, very I just quickly. heard in Hawaii, the, especially the Big Island, they're really big organic growers there. They've got a pretty uh, nice environment uh, and they're isolated. Right. And they're trying so desperately to grow their own food because they right. import 85% uh, and it's very expensive. Yeah. And but Monsanto's buying thousands of acres. They has are bought, has, has bought, years. and they, they yeah. want. And they're and they're so afraid. They're, they, they're, it they've is. got eight thousand acres or something they're, like that they're, on Molokai, I, be, I believe. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure of the acreage number, but it's in the thousands of acres that that they that they're and they've got, you know, Molokai bound up with the transgenic stuff. Uh -huh. You can't do anything else there, mm. uh, but the Big Island. Also, you know, they're they're uh, fighting. So why do they want that? See, Monsanto. They want the isolation. They want, yeah, they, that's right. They Monsanto. want the isolation and they want the climate. I'm telling you, the Willamette Valley, Hawaii, the climate is great. I mean, you can grow seed here in Virginia, yeah. but one reason we have some growers who are like in Oregon is certain crops we can grow and we can get seed. And if you're saving a little bit for yourself, that's fine. But for the same amount of effort, they can get eight times as much seed with less uh, problems, you know, with any, uh, you know, funguses and stuff uh, attacking that, we, it because of the time. We see that in everything, why all the salad comes from the, yeah. the and, Salinas Valley. In and so California. Monsanto wants to take over and have control of most of these prime seed growing regions and and actually mostly they're not growing gmos at this point because they own so many non-gmo varieties that of course people should pay attention to uh which varieties uh come from monsanto so that they're not spending their hard-earned dollars supporting it because they bought lots of conventional seed companies 
If 70. I buy a pack 70. of seeds, how do I know well, one without thing, running a DNA right, test? Well, one thing how that you know? can do is uh, Fedco Seeds uh, has put up a list of varieties that are commonly available mm -hmm. that uh, Monsanto owns. The uh, GMO as GM, well as non-modified. Yeah, and these are non, their list is, is primarily not, it, you know, not conventional seeds that Monsanto owns. We, you know, we've thought of it, we just haven't quite got the resources to get all of that and keep it up to date because people buy and sell companies a lot. Uh, but, uh, and the other thing is most of these older varieties that they can, uh, that they have actually have just regular PVP patents, which will expire shortly. And like one of the things we do with those conventional varieties is hold on to some seed. And then when that patent expires, uh, offer probably. some organic seed of it. Now do the patents expire on, uh, GMO material? No! Well, they do someday, 50 years. Well, Why are they, they different? Here's than, what they do. Because they're, they're made for here's what they trains do. and hardware. I mean, hardware. for practical purposes, oh. they're not expiring because they change the traits slightly and re get a new patent. And so, And they take the old one off the market five or six years before the patent expires. Uh, too, so that uh, people who are into transgenics cannot save back seed mm -hmm. in any substantial quantity long enough to use the old trait. Not that we will want to ourselves, but even someone who will want to would have trouble because these are field crops. Right. Well, then they have a contract. They, they have a contract that Monsanto has that makes people buy the seed fresh every year anyway. That's part of the, when you well, open a bag of their seed, you... You, you have to use it in a certain period of time. Well, and you, and you have to buy new seed next year. You, there's no way that you can get, if you've ever bought their seed, that you can ever again uh, get, get a, uh, um, a, sa a back to seed saving. Right. Well, at, at least, no. Only you, if you're talking about with their transgenics things. I mean, you're sort of carrying it. It's only about their genetics that right. you have to... You, look at that thing, the back of that, the packet of those, just for fun. Go into, you know, a regular uh, farmer seed place and pick up a packet of, of this. It's just by mm -hmm. opening this packet, you agree, you know, to so give that's your how you know when it's really modified because Monsanto. there's a yeah. there's a eula on there. But there's <laughs> they also you can also tell about seeds that are not GMO that they control because they're starting to put that on farmer quantities of the conventional seeds that they are selling as well because I think they have plans in the future. Well, there you have it. The reason why we need to really be watching transgenic material and stay tuned next week for more about this court case and this attempt of 83 plaintiffs to try to stop the ownership of plant genes. This program is a production of Meet the Farmer TV LLC in association with Planet Earth Diversified, Nelly Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design.